Let people in. All right, hello everybody. It is just at about six o'clock. So thank you for all of you who are here and welcome to our September Green Thumb Lecture. And as you probably already know, in case you just jumped in not knowing what we we're gonna talk about tonight, we're gonna be talking about um, invasive plants and invasive plant management. And we have Carly Evans who is here to share with us um, tonight. And Carly is, I always mess up, I'm gonna see if I can get it right. One of the, the words in the, <laughs> coordinator for the Northeast Georgia Invasive Plant Coalition. All right, cooperative. cooperative. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's always between those two. <laughs> That's all right. But um, she's great. She shared with us before. And um, I know that invasive plants in my own home yard and our project gardens that we have and all around this part of the state and probably the state as a whole, um, we have plenty of invasive plants in the southeast and they can be really hard to deal with. Um, I will say a couple of things for housekeeping. If you've never been in one of our uh, Green Thumb lectures before, the way that we will do questions is that feel free to put any question you have in the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring that real time and we'll break in and ask those questions for Carly during the presentation. Um, if your question is not answered during the presentation itself, we also have additional time at the end where hopefully I will get to whatever's in the chat, but also at the end of the presentation, everybody is welcome to unmute themselves and just chat and ask a question if they'd rather do that as well. And at the end of this um, presentation, there will be a link at the end and then we'll email you out um, a very brief evaluation. If you've done it before, it's pretty painless, but we really use them. It's not just like a thing we do. We use them every year um, as we're preparing these next Green Thumb lectures, which we will start doing in just a couple of months now. So if you have any comments, good or bad or neutral, um, we love hearing all suggestions and we really do work those into the programming. So um, if you'll take a minute uh, tonight or tomorrow to do that evaluation when we send it out to you, that'd be amazing. Um, but I'm going to stop holding us up and I will let Carly go ahead and take over the screen and we'll get going. Awesome. Welcome everybody. I'm Carly. Okay, so I'm gonna stop your screen sharing. Okay, oh well. <laughs> Let me pull up my presentation. Okay, everybody can see that? Oh, I'm muted. Yeah, that looks good for me. <laughs> okay, awesome. You. I always forget how to do this, you guys. This is, I just want to, <laughs> oh, here we go. All right. Well, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for being here. I'm Harley Evans. Um, as Laura said, I'm the coordinator for the Northeast Georgia Invasive Plant Cooperative. Um, I'm also a stewardship coordinator at Athens Land Trust. So I work with um, our, our landowners, folks who um, have conservation easements on their property. Um, Yes, so welcome to Identifying and Managing Invasive Plant Species in the Georgia Piedmont. Um, I have to always give a shout out to my colleague, Gary Kreider, because he taught me mostly everything I know about invasive plants. Um, so he's, he's always included in all of my um, presentations. You know, I just have to say, thanks Gary for teaching me everything I know. Um, all right, let's get started. So I like to start first with some definitions. I, I hope, you know, probably you already are well aware of all these definitions, but, um, you know, native plants occur naturally over millennia and they're in a particular region. Um, Non-native or exotic plants occur artificially beyond its natural range, 
but there is a difference between a non-native and an invasive plant. So an invasive or an exotic pest plant is non-native and it aggressively competes with the native ecosystem. And actually an important part of the definition of an invasive plant is that it causes environmental or economic harm. Um, invasive plants disrupt ecological functions, they reduce biodiversity. And then we have weeds, you know, so weed, if you're gardening, you may encounter weeds way more often than if you are managing um, a forest or your backyard, you know, so, so first your little garden in the front, you'll have weeds, but the rest of your yard, you may have invasive plants. So they tend to be more, um, you know, a bigger issue than a weed. And, and a native plant can be a weed if it's just a plant in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what does it really mean for species to be invasive? So they have abundant reproduction. They can reproduce both by seeds and by roots often. Um, they're extremely adaptable and easily established. That's you know, the, the main reason why they have, why they're here, right? They're able to be here. They lack natural competition. So they have an edge over natives. And a lot of um, invasive plants, especially in the Georgia Piedmont region, um, have this extra advantage of being evergreen. Um, they are typically pest-free, which is back to that lacking natural competition, um, as, as well as natural, lacking natural competition. They, they um, have no native insects or diseases to check their growth. Um, and additionally, they often have rapid growth and efficient spread. So we need to sort of change our mindsets about plants and, and the environment. A lot of times, you know, especially in the gardening world, I would say we tend to value plants for what they look like. And we need to shift our focus to value plants for their ecological function. Um, an example of this is poison ivy, which I know we all hate. I'm not asking you to truly love poison ivy. I'm personally, um, I, I come up even on, on poison ivy. I don't love it or hate it. Um, it is a really good native plant. It provides really important um, fruits for birds and um, it doesn't harm the tree trees that it's in. It just harms you if you rub up against it. So stay away from it, but you know, we try not to kill it. Um, so impacts of in, invasive plants on human health and, and on the economy. So um, billions are spent annually on invasive plant damage and control on public and private lands. Um, while a lot of this work is done in Georgia, this number comes um, mostly out West. There, there are massive efforts to control invasive plants. Um, and I, I wish we had more broad scale control here. Um, although we are definitely spending some money on it. I'm, I'm paid to do it, so <laughs> somebody's paying me. Um, there are health problems as a result of overabundant pollen production from invasive plants. There are fire hazards associated with invasive plants. Um, there's also uh, limitations, you know, when it comes to land for recreation, hiking, et cetera. You know, even at Walker Park, which is right around the corner from me, one of my favorite parks in Athens, um, used to be Trail Creek Park, for those of you who may be fam familiar. Um, there are established trails, but we're, you know, if you wanted to establish a new trail, it's nearly impossible with the amount of invasives that have encroached into that area. Um, this, <laughs> this last impact on human health may only be true for people like Gary and me, but um, I tend to experience psychological anxiety for since that our surroundings are out of control. You know, just seeing the sheer amount of invasives um, out there can be really stressful and create a sense of anxiety, but that may be pushing it a little bit. I'm with you on that one, Garth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so invasive plants also compete unfairly against native plants, you know, for all sorts of resources for water, sunlight, nutrients, and especially I would say space, which leads to a decline in 
and diversity of native plants, especially. Um, they disrupt the ecological process of succession. You know, uh, after say a prescribed burn, you really hope that the succession of the native plants would come back, but in the in the in a severely invaded area, um, the invasives will prevent the native seed bank from coming to be because there's either too much shade cover or um, other competition from invasive plants. Um, they replace complex plant communities um, with monocultures. You know that's often how you'll see an invaded air. You know. There, there are, is a diversity of invasive plants in the Piedmont region, which is a shame, but often when you see a heavily invaded area, you notice that there is one plant that has just totally taken over a site um, with a monoculture of a single species. A lot of the invasive plants in the area will kill trees and shrubs through girdling, um, like literally strangling a tree to death, and then also through shading just um, coming up into a tree and completely shading it out so that that tree then can't get any sunlight. Um, surprising, this is, was surprising for me to learn um, that a lot of plants actually have the ability to alter the soil chemistry. They are nitrogen fixing, which helps them maintain a really healthy environment for themselves, um, but alters the soil chemistry in such a way that nothing else can grow within the range of it. Um, they also compete with native plants for pollinators. So this can be, you know, we not only are they competing against native plants by taking over their resources, but they are preventing native plants from being pollinated because of their, you know, bright, stinky flowers that um, the bees are more drawn to. So um, they create a loss of habitat and food sources for native insects and birds and other wildlife. Because they did not evolve here, most non-native plants are unpalatable to our native insects. So while invasive plants can provide an opportunity for pollinators, they um, are unpalatable to other insects. You know, So for example, up to 9,000 caterpillars are required to raise one clutch of chickadees. And caterpillar, you know, our native caterpillars are not eating our invasive plants, they're only eating native plants. So if there's not enough native plant for the caterpillar to eat, then there are not caterpillars, and then there are not birds, you know, or chickadees. 96% of terrestrial birds rely on insects to raise their young. Um, and insects rely on native plants. So um, so Birds tend to sometimes, there, there are certain invasive plants that birds really are drawn to their fruit. They, it's really tasty for them, but it's a really low nutritional value. Um, so it's like uh, um, eating McDonald's when you really need maple or something. I don't know if you guys are local to Athens, but when you need a, a healthy meal, but McDonald's is right there. So, so you know, you hear about food deserts and urban environments, it creates sort of this food desert for wildlife. It's a similar concept. So um, there is a list of non-native invasive plants in Georgia on the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council. If you're interested in, in reviewing a full list, that this is the best place to, to go. Um, and it's divided up into four categories. So, you know, from most serious, you know, biggest invasive plant in the area, as far as acreage, um, to it's not quite a problem right now, but it potentially could be, you know, that's category two and three. So this is just a good um, resource if you want to check it out. But we um, at the land for, at the NGICP have our own sort of dirty dozen list. These are the worst we believe in this area specifically or in the Georgia Piedmont really, but um, we've noticed that you know, this list was drawn because of, of our observations in the athens Clark County area and surrounding areas. Um, so our, our list is these 12, which I will just say really quick, Chaffee stilt grass, um, beefsteak plant, which is also known as perilla mint, 
Chinese wisteria, Chinese privet, English ivy, bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, and thorny olive. Both of those are iliagonous. We have the deciduous versus the evergreen. Um, Nandina, Mahonia, calorie pear, and Japanese knotweed. Um, this is an important note about kudzu that I've included here. You know, everybody thinks kudzu is terrible. Kudzu is terrible, and I'm not here to tell you that kudzu is not a terrible invasive. But um, in regards to the highest impact as a land manager that invasive plants have, most of that worst impact occurs in the forest um, because that's you know the best wildlife habitat. That's the best. Um, that's where the eco true healthy ecosystems are. And kudzu appears sort of outside of that. Kudzu, um, it, it's, it's never not detected because it is so easy to spot. As soon as there is an invasion of kudzu, you will see it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it will be treated immediately as we all know, driving through anywhere in Georgia, um, but it, it enters an area because of a disturbance. So it cannot, this is true about most of our mesas, they come in because of a disturbance, but with kudzu especially, you know, it's along the highway because there's been significant clearing there. So the environment was already damaged and then the kudzu came in um, and it's, it's noticeable. It doesn't spread by seed. It, it only, and it's not um, sold in the nursery trade. So it's, it's never undetected, requires full sun. Um, that's why it's not on our list. So if you were thinking kudzu is the worst invasive in the world, you may be wrong, but it is pretty bad. So Carly, real quick, because I had a good question and it's related to something you just mentioned. Um, we had a question in the chat. Is it true that Georgia does not have a noxious weed law that would prevent invasive plants from being sold in nurseries? Yes. Um, you can go to almost any, I mean, there, there are some nurseries that, that intentionally do not sell invasives, which we love to see, but I would love to see a movement from folks like you working with folks like me to push for legislation, to push for at least some sort of policy interpretation, something that could help us um, to prevent the legal sale of invasives. Um, so we, we had a follow-up about what can people do to change that? Or to, is that like a matter of calling or writing a letter to your representatives or what do you guys, have you guys dealt with that? So that, that is sort of, I would say something that the NGICP needs to develop. I think we, we should create a way for, um, you know, maybe it's um, a list of signee, maybe it's, a, a policy a we propose and present, yeah, a, or a petition. So um, right now, I would, I would say do some research, um, however comfortable you are with, you know, even with your local reps, this can be, an, you know, just to, um, or, or with your local nurseries, even, you know, I've, I've had some success with smaller nurseries saying, hey, you know, um, this is an extremely bad plant for this environment and I think you should stop selling it. And you could even say like, a, if you don't stop selling it, I'll post it all over Facebook. And you're being a bad, <laughs> um, you know, environmentalist. Uh, you know, that, that kind of pressure does truly help, but I think your, your first question is really important. You know, how can we um, make a difference on a bigger scale? Because it, it needs to be, I think a more, there needs to be a cohesive voice, um, you know, a, a pro native plant voice yeah. um, or policy or law in place. And there is not right now. Um, yeah, you know, even, I mean, Lowe's and Home Depot aren't the best places to go to buy your plants, but they have, you know, almost all exotic plants. Um, local nurseries are a little bit better, but they still have, you know, English ivy to this day. So, yeah. I mean, I think the point to be made there is a lot of the reason these things became so widespread is because they were popular landscaping plants because they don't die <laughs> and you can plant them exactly. anywhere. Um, exactly. Anybody who's moved into an established home with a yard full of Nandina 
you know, or whatever. But anyway, that was a great question. Um, I think we could probably have a whole meeting about uh, potential. Anyway, you guys feel free to send me an email if anybody's kind of interested in, you know, a movement and I will pass that along to Carly because that is what they deal with um, on a local level. So appreciate that. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, I, yeah, we need to, I need to be doing more in that specific field, you know, in an advocacy way. So thank you for saying that. Um, so if you're looking for your own sort of identification guide um, for while you're walking in the woods or looking at your backyard, um, the Brown book um, by Jim Miller, which is a field guide for the identification of invasive plants in Southern forests is um, a really good resource. And it can be, it's, it's free online to download as a, it's not a phone app. This is a mistype. It's a you, know, you can download it as a PDF on your phone and be able to you know scroll through and it's um, easy to read even on a phone. So um, then also in GICP has released its own guide, which is specific about to the Georgia Piedmont and these 12 plants that I mentioned before that are dirty dozen. Um, um, I <laughs> this this presentation says you get your own copy to take home today, which, um, may not be necessarily true, but you can go to our website and download a copy to take home today. And then if anybody is interested, I do have um, lots of hard copies on hand and can leave them on the front porch of the land trust to pick up or um, give them to Laura to distribute. You know, however, if anybody's interested in, in having a physical copy of that, please let me know. Um, but you can find that on the Athens Land Trust website. Um, and there's other sorts of identification online that Georgia EPSI website, bugwood.org and invasive.org are all good resources. Okay, so we're gonna start a little bit, we're gonna go pretty quickly through identification. You know, I think I wanna focus on management um, methods most, but identification can be really important. I don't know what your base level of, um, knowledge about the, the most common invasive plants in the area are. So we're gonna start there. Um, so first thing is um, leaf arrangements. So with, when almost all of, our, of the most prominent invasive plants in the Georgia Piedmont um, have opposite leaf structure, almost all of the native plant, not this, this may be kind of broad, but, but if it has opposite leaves, and it's um, a shrubby plant and you think it might be invasive, it almost definitely is. Um, most of our native um, woody plants have alternate leaves. So this is just sort of a, the, the easiest, very most basic way to um, determine whether or not something may be invasive. So privet, this is our, our number one guy. <laughs> he's he's um, Chinese privet is one of the worst invaders in the entire Southeast. I'm trying to remember the exact amount of acreage that I think it covers. It's you know, thousands and thousands of acres covered in privet. Um, Chinese privet is a shrub up to 16 feet tall and 10 in inches in, let me move all my screens, 10 inches in diameter. The bark is smooth and light gray. The leaves are pretty small. They're one to two inches long. Privet is, is fairly evergreen, especially in the, this climate. Um, the leaves are opposite. That's you know what, what I was just saying. That's the easiest identification for privet is, okay, small, evergreen, and opposite leaves, it's privet. Um, the leaves have no teeth on the margins. It blooms in late spring and produce, produces clusters of small white flowers. And um, oops, let me move this. and uh, it, the fruits are very small and black, and they privet is beginning to fruit now. I haven't been seeing much fruiting privet right now, but it, it's about to be fruiting. So why is privet such a problem? It is shade tolerant. It invades the understory of natural areas. 
especially floodplains. It forms dense monocultural thickets. It spreads by both seeds and root sprouts. Um, and it is still sold and planted as a desirable hedge plant. Um, this is a very depressing fact, fun fact, but um, I'm sure you're all aware of the phrase between the hedges the, for UGA football. Um, those hedges are actually Chinese privet. Um, this is another opportunity for us to form a petition, right? So we should petition to have the hedges changed to a native, um, which, which has been attempted before. UGA claims that um, because they don't ever allow it to fruit, they're not, um, they're not spreading privet, which I guess, but it's still, it sets a bad example, I would think, as the university to have this invasive plant as, as the famous hedges. Um, it also is not killed by fire. This is a really kind of crazy fact about Chinese privet. Okay, 2.7 million acres. That was the number I was looking for on the last slide. It's just a huge amount. Um, and as we go through these, you will notice that the, the, the why is it such a problem slides are, are very consistent. You know, this is back to the, the beginning of, of, you know, when we were talking about what is an invasive plant. An invasive plant is um, easily established, which almost always means shade tolerant. Um, you know, it has the ability to establish itself in, in the forest. Um, bush honeysuckle is our second plant. It is a deciduous, deciduous multi-stemmed shrub up to 20 feet tall. It's usually about five feet tall. Um, it can be pretty easily identified by looking at the bark, um, but only if it is a mature enough bush honeysuckle. When it's young, the bark can be um, fairly smooth, but as it matures, um, the stems are brittle, they snap easily. The bark is kind of shredding um, and it has very deep grooves in it. Um, it flowers and fruits in pairs, which are held at the base of the leaves. And the leaves are opposite. Again, that's a theme you'll see. Um, they are not toothed. And the, the flowers, um, you know, you probably hope, you know, wear a honeysuckle, but are usually a cream, cream color um, and smell very nice. So it's a problem again, because it's shade tolerant, it's adapted to a wide range of conditions and it therefore outcompetes native shrubs and tree seedlings. There is a theory that it may be aliopathic. Um, it leaves out early, so it shades the forest floor. So, um, early spring wildflowers, native wildflowers will not come up without the, you know, the sign from, from above that it's time because they, the soil won't be warmed if there's too much shade. Um, it's spread very readily by birds because the red fruit is really attractive to them and provides them with carbohydrates, but um, not, not a fat rich fruit. It just is really sugary. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a, it spreads by both seed and root sprouts. Okay. Um, autumn olive, which is the deciduous iliagnus, is a multi stemmed shrub up to 20 feet tall. This one is a nitrogen fixer. It is both shade and drought tolerant, um, and it is spread by birds um, who eat the berries. The leaves are alternate. And um, the, the easiest way I found to identify Iliagnus was the, this, these sort of silvery scales, which are on the underside of the leaf. And they don't necessarily look like scales unless you are looking very closely. But if you're trying to determine if something is Iliagnus um, and it just looks, you know, glossy and green on top, if you flip that leaf over and it is reflective in the sun, um, that is a sign that it is Iliagnus. Um, the stems are brittle. The flowers are very fragrant. They're also white to creamy yellow, similar to honeysuckle. Um, and the fruits are also bright red, similar to honeysuckle. 
So why is it a problem? It is shade tolerant and invades the forest interior and takes over the shrub layer. Um, another issue or, or you know, a main reason why we have a lot of invasive plants in this region or um, why invasive plants exist at all is actually due to, due to humans. You know, we, we brought Iliagnus here and planted it as a land management strategy um, for erosion control, which is the same, same story with kudzu, right? It was, it was used for erosion control. So, you know, I'll, or, or a lot of our plants are, you know, pretty and easy to, easy to um, keep alive as Laura was mentioning. And so, you know, th these, these are here because of us, right? So it's, it's up to us to get rid of them, I would say. So um, as a nitrogen fixer, fixer, it alters soil chemistry. Its fruit is also very attractive to birds. And so it's spread through their poop and it is drought tolerant. So thorny olive, very similar to autumn olive, also Iliagnus. This is the evergreen Iliagnus. Um, so for this, the, the difference really is that the leaves are a little bit glossier and the underside of the leaves are a little bit more scaly and shiny. Um, so it's, it's actually, I would say, much easier to identify. Um, autumn olive can sometimes be a little bit like privet to me. The leaves are um, opposite, which, um, oh wait, leaves are alternate, <laughs> sorry, but they, they grow in the same areas, you know, in an invaded forest and um, in the same sort of shapes. They're, they're shrubby. Um, and green. <laughs> um, so with thorny olive, it can, um, it has these long shoots, which are called whips, which emerge from the top of the shrub. Um, and to, as its name suggests, the stems are tipped with two to three inch long thorns. Um, the thorns can go all the way down the, um, the, the trunks as well. Um, so leaves are dark green and shiny, the lower leaf surfaces have those, um, they're, they're iridescent, but have those same scales. The flowers are, again, creamy white, fragrant, um, and the fruits are red. It's a problem for very similar reasons as the other Iliagnus. It is shade tolerant, um, drought tolerant. It, was widely planted on highway medians and sometimes is still planted as an ornamental. The seeds are dispersed by animals. Um, it's also really hard to remove because of its thorns and also its dense stems. Nandina is one you will likely find in your front yard or your neighbor's front yard. Um, I think these slides got, went backwards. So. Um, it has multiple woody stems that arrive from a, that arise from a single root stock. The bark, if you look closely enough, appears deeply fissured, which is actually similar bark to bush honeysuckle, a mature bush honeysuckle, although these um, stems are much thinner. Um, it is evergreen, can reach seven feet in height, and the bright red berries uh, form in April and can persist all the way through winter. So why is it a problem? It's shade tolerant, it invades forest floors. It's difficult to remove because um, it sprouts so easily from root fragments. So if you think that you can just pull up your Nandina, you probably will have a new Nandina in a couple months because those root fragments can um, re-sprout very easily. That's still a popular ornamental widely sold in the nursery trade. This is the most interesting fact about Nandina. It is, um, it, it essentially contains cyanide. It, it contains a precursor compound to hydrogen cyanide. Um, and because of that, it is fatal to um, birds, to cedar waxwings. It's fatal to cats. It's fatal to some grazing animals as well. Um, so the, the very least you can do is um, if you have Nandina is cut off your berries. You can use them as decoration in your house if you want, but do not put them as decoration on your porch. Birds will still come eat them. Um, they're just 
bright red and attractive, but deadly. Um, Mahonia is um, another it's sort of similar to Nandina. It's a, another ornamental. Um, it's an evergreen shrub up to 10 feet. It um, has yellow flowers in early spring and spikes at the tip, tips of its branches. It fruits in clusters and they often look um, powdery sort of with a waxy coating. The leaves can be six to 12 inches long with up to 15 leaflets. And it looks um, very similar, can look very similar to holly if you aren't um, more familiar with identification. Um, the inside of it is a bright yellow, which to me just looks so toxic and scary, um, but it is Nandina that is actually toxic. Um, Mahonia is again, shade tolerant. It invades forest interiors. Um, deer avoid it. So and I'm sure you, as the gardeners, you're probably all aware deer love our native shrubs, um, but they will stay away from a lot of our invasive shrubs, especially this one. Um, the birds love the fruits and will spread it widely. Japanese still grass is sort of a, a newcomer to the invasive world, um, in, especially in the Georgia Piedmont. You know, a, a couple years ago, it was some places. Now it is, it is truly everywhere. Um, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It's really sad to, to see how, how much this plant has spread throughout this region. Um, it is a delicate annual grass. And if you look very closely, it has sort of a similar structure to bamboo. It flowers in late summer to fall and sets seed in September. If you have Japanese silk grass on your uh, property right now, I would suggest mowing it immediately. So, you know, if you can mow before it sets seed, um, you can save yourself a lot of trouble, um, but we'll talk about management later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the mid vein of the leaf is silvery or pale and shiny. This is sort of the, the easiest identification I've found for Japanese stilt grass, when, especially when it is next to other grasses. Um, it has this mid vein that is slightly off center and it is um, silvery and pale. The leaf blades are two to four inches long. Um, and it can grow pretty tall. It can grow up to, I'd say, you know, four feet. Usually it stays about two feet and it um, forms very dense mats and exclude native herbs that way. Um, it has a hairy leaf sheet. So that's Japanese stilt grass. So it's a problem because that it's shade tolerant. It overwhelms the native seedlings. It also um, produces about a thousand seeds per plant. So if you look at this photo here, that is quite a lot of seeds. The seeds spread really widely and flood and flooding, and they're carried on anything. They're super tiny. They're super light, so they spread very easily, um, and they stay persist, they persist in this seed bank for up to five years, which is so depressing that even if you manage for five years straight, you will still have still grass coming back, but it's worth it. You just have to do it for five years straight. Um, and it can also spread by rooting at the nodes, not only by seed. Okay, perilla mint or beefsteak plant. Um, this is actually often found in similar conditions as stilt grass. So if you notice stilt grass, look around and you may find some perilla mint as well. Um, it is, this is also um, shiso plant, which you may have heard if you are an avid cooker. Um, so it has um, opposite leaves with deeply, deeply toothed margins. Um, and they can be purple or green or variegated. Um, and it smells um, very much like basil. It has a pretty pungent smell. It's sort of like a sweet basil, kind of like a Thai basil. Um, it has stems up to three feet tall with um, deep grooves running the length of the stem. And it can look a lot like basil as well, which is non-invasive. 
So um, it has been cultivated in, in the US as a culinary herb. Um, it is a culinary herb in Asian cooking. Um, but it's similar to um, microstegium or Japanese siltgrass has a very large seed crop and a very long-term seed bank. Um, so that's, that's why it has persisted. And um, you know, it, it also forms dense, pat dense patches. So it outcompetes native herbaceous plants in the same way as siltgrass. Um, it also is toxic to livestock, which um, you'd hope would help us get it out of some areas in Georgia, but um, still working on it. So wisteria is, um, I believe, our only invasive vine on the list, but it um, has smooth gray bark and it can reach up to 15 inches in diameter, which to me is more like a tree trunk. That's some, you know, when you're managing wisteria, it can feel tree-like. <laughs> It, it spreads by seeds, but also by ground level stems that produce shoots and roots. And it forms um, deep woody carrot like roots. It has um, velvety or like hairy fruits. And um, I'm, I'm believe you guys probably know what wisteria looks like. It has really beautiful purple flowers. Um, and it also has the opposite leaf structure, as you can see in this photo down below. Um, it's a problem because it blocks sunlight to kill very large trees, but it also can girdle younger trees and kill them that way. Um, it creates dense ground layer thickets that exclude seedlings. Um, this is you know, similar ground cover um, created as created by stilt grass, et cetera. Um, and it is still sold in the nursery trade, which is very sad. Essentially, wisteria is sort of a death sentence for your tree. If, if there is invasive wisteria, Chinese wisteria in a tree and it's not managed, that tree will die. It's, it's only a matter of when, unfortunately. English ivy. Oh, so, um, English ivy flowers and sets fruit at the tops of trees or in other vertical positions. This is sort of a fun fact about English ivy. It does not fruit when it is on the ground as ground cover, um, but it still um, shades out seedlings, et cetera, um, as a ground cover. It's still bad as a ground cover, but um, the leaves on flowering stems become simpler and more uniform in shape. I actually had a really hard time for a while identifying English ivy um, when it was, you know, it can sometimes grow almost like, um, almost like a shrub sort of in, a, in the right situation. And in that, in those situations, the leaves are also much more simple. They don't have that, um, you know, famous English ivy look to them. And um, if you don't, you know, look closely, you, you may overlook a patch of English ivy um, if it's growing in that way. Um, its stems are covered with aerial roots, very similar to poison ivy or Virginia creeper, um, but English ivy is evergreen. That is the easiest way to identify first um, our native vines. So why is it a problem? It is shade, drought, and salt tolerant. It invades the interior of forests, outcompetes native species on the ground layer, it also, similar to wisteria, will kill a tree. Um, once it's in the canopy, it blocks sunlight. It also is very heavy, so it makes trees really vulnerable to blowing over in storms. If there's English ivy in your tree, that tree is now double the weight. Um, it spreads both by seed and stem spread, but again, the seeds are only produced when it's growing vertically. Um, it also is a reservoir for bacterial leaf scorch that can affect a wide variety of both native and ornamental trees. And it's still sold in, as an ornamental and as carefree ground cover in the nursery trade. So it's a good one to petition to get rid of. Calorie pear is a deciduous tree. This is not a shrub, this is a full size tree can be 30 to 50 feet tall um, and has, is very wide and has thorny twigs. 
has alternate leaves. Um, and it has very beautiful fall colors <laughs> and lots of white flowers. So, you know, when you're driving down the highway and it seems like every other tree is covered in these white flowers, um, you probably are seeing invasive calorie pear. Um, it flowers in early spring, so um, you won't be seeing those flowers right now, but keep an eye out there all over. Um, the fruits are small. They really are like miniature pears. Um, because of that, birds love them and spread them very widely. So it is a problem because it forms dense thickets and crowd out, crowds out native plants that way. It spreads both by seeds and rhizomes, um, similar to bamboo. Additionally, seedlings produce fruit within three years, which is extremely rapid for a fruiting tree. And it produces a hu huge amounts of seeds, which are dispersed um, both by birds and mammals. It has extremely thick, pointy, hard, heavy thorns that are, are extremely ha hazardous and can even puncture tire tractor tires. And um, it's noted as becoming, you know, a as bad as privet and kudzu. Japanese knotweed is also um, a little bit new to this region, but has established itself very quickly. Um, it has mature stems that are hollow, woody, and bamboo-like. The stems are usually speckled with red. Um, the leaves are triangular with a flat or V-shaped ba bases, and the side shoots are zigzag. This is my easiest tip for identifying Japanese knotweed is that sort of famous zigzag pattern with the triangle, triangular leaves. And it blooms um, about now. So it, it forms large patches that spread in, by underground stems, which are rhizomes, very similar to bamboo in that way. It can reach up to 12 feet in height, and it also produces an abundant amount of seed. So once it's established, it is really hard to control a, um, an invasive plant that, that is spread through rhizomes because it means that if you kill one patch, um, you know, there, there's still all of this healthy, this healthiness underground, right? Because it's all, all of the nutrients are stored together in that rhizome. Okay, these are some um, emerging problem plants. Carly, before we go on, uh, we had a good question. It's a clarification question about calorie pear um, versus Bradford pear. And I, I get that question a lot. So it's a good one to talk about for a minute. Do you want to take that? Sure. Yes. Um, so they essentially now are unfortunately kind of the same thing. So, so Bradford is a cultur uh, cultivar of calorie pear. Um, Calorie, uh, Bradford pear is meant to um, not be able to um, reproduce. So it was sort of um, cultivated to, um, you know, be used as an ornamental plant, um, as a decorative tree, and it is sterile. Um, but calorie pear is not, and calorie pear is known to be able to sort of breed with Bradford pear. Um, so Bradford pear trees are, are sort of essentially almost as bad as calorie pear now um, because that, that sterileness um, is only applicable if it's a Bradford pear and a Bradford pear can create fruit. So a calorie pear can, um, I think that that- Yeah, that no, answer? absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So basically Bradford pears, if they were just Bradford pears out there in our landscapes, probably wouldn't pose that big of an issue. But calorie pears, the non-cultivar, are all over the place and their pollen can produce fruit in Bradford pear. So Bradford pear can produce essentially a bunch of mixed invasive pear trees <laughs> still. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's a, a, a list of emerging problem plants. I think I'm not really watching the time, but I tend to over talk. I hope I'm not. Okay. Um, these are probably plants that you may have. You know, a lot of these are, are really sort of 
already problem plants. I would say golden bamboo is one, honeysuckle vine, floriope you see, you know, in everybody's front yard. Multiflora rose has become pretty bad. Mimosa, another tree, princess tree, and Japanese privet, those are all really large invasives. And, um, you know, once established, they're really hard to control because they are full-size trees. Um, trying to vary, yeah. So look out for these, but. Um, there are also some plants that are not necessarily invasive to the Georgia Piedmont because they are not technically non-native. They are native to the coastal plain of Georgia, but not native to the Georgia Piedmont. Um, so I guess we would call them weedy. I tend to, if I'm, if I'm managing a property for invasives, I will sort of treat these Piedmont invaders, the coastal plain invaders as invasives, um, but they're, they're weeding, weedy. Um, the magnolia, unfortunately, which we all love. Um, if I see it, you know, a totally mature magnolia, I'm not going to bother with it. But if it has a bunch of um, small, sp small re-sprouts all around the base, I usually will manage those in hopes that, um, you know, just outside of the leaf cover of the magnolia, which is significant and creates too much shade for the forest floor, you know, that at least outside of that, um, native seedlings can uh, do well. Uh, cherry laurel is one, and yopan holly as well. Okay, this is maybe a good time to take like a three minute break if you guys are wanting that. I, I can't see your chat. Let me pull it up. Anyway, is anybody? I'm yeah, I'm no, I mean, the no. restroom is what I'm going to Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> it's a perfectly reasonable. Yeah, let's do three minutes. So that'll put us right at 6.55. So if anybody else needs to stretch their legs, use the restroom, grab some water, we'll see y'all back here in just a couple minutes. Thanks. I like your little break slide in there, Charlie. <laughs> Intermission. 
<laughs> right. Intermission or mission impossible. So intermission the, impossible. Right. Yes. The, the, this slide is, it's a good break point, but it also just shows you, you know, just how bad an, an area can look. Um, totally. Just in there's, when you see in it, you know, this is back to my psychological anxiety, seeing an invaded site, um, but it can be really overwhelming and seem very impossible. But what I'm about to talk about is that it's not impossible. We can totally do it. it just takes a lot of manpower. All right, well, so, I'll let you take it away. We're at uh, 6.55, so it's a good place to start. Awesome. All right, here we go. So, I, love, I just like this quote a lot. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Um, that has definitely proven to be true in my work doing invasive management. Um, you know, a site can, can cause lots of psychological anxiety. And then after, you know, a really solid work day, you feel so accomplished. Um, you can, it is totally possible to restore a healthy ecosystem. It just takes time and effort um, and some sweat. <laughs> so there are local volunteer opportunities you can do um, to help clear invasives, you know, on, on public land locally. You can volunteer with me through NGICP. You can volunteer with the State Botanical Garden. You could receive a certificate in native plants. Um, you can work with the Restore Our River project um, with the athens Clark County Office of Sustainability. And then um, the Weed Warriors, that's Gary's effort. Um, I'm not sure if they are currently still doing um, invasive management work days regularly right now, but I believe that will be picking up again soon if, if it's not happening right now. But I have plenty of opportunities. So if you want to come help me out and kill some invasive plants, come on. So how do we win this battle against invasives? Um, identification first. That's why I always start with that section. Um, you have to know your plants. You have to know your natives and your exotics. Um, your best bet is to recognize invasives in all seasons because actually Winter, especially in the Georgia Piedmont, is often the best time to do invasive removal. Um, you have to learn the best control methods and select the most efficient methods and tools. Um, you need to educate your friends and neighbors. You can maybe work with your neighbors to specify a, a target species. You know, if you want to get everyone on your block to get all their Nandina out. Um, that could be a way to win the battle and then, you know, move on to Liriope next or Privet or, you know, whatever's in your neighborhood. Um, discuss your concerns with garden shops that sell invasive plants, as I mentioned earlier. And then eventually replant with native species. Um, that has an asterisk next to, us, next to it because um, often people jump straight to this step of replanting with native species. And um, actually the NGICP's suggestion is to, um, uh, after clearing an area of invasives is actually to allow the, na the, the natural seed bank to, uh, you know, allow it to release itself and, and almost always natives will come up. Um, they've been laying dormant because there has been too much shade cover and they'll pop right up. Oh, I just said this. <laughs> um, so it's usually best to wait one to three years. Um, and that, so not only because the native seed bank will come up, but also because um, follow-up treatments are almost always necessary with invasive management. It's, it's never really a one and done as much as I would love for it to be. Um, the native plants on site can recover and flourish, increase sunlight, and new seeds will come in as well. So invasives are like an infection. So what we're doing is um, healing a sick environment by removing the invasives. So we're, we're, you know, repairing a damaged ecosystem and reducing the impact of invasives, which is habitat restoration. So what we're doing 
through invasive control or invasive management is habitat restoration. And I think this is just a good way of framing, framing invasive management in your mind is at least for me, you know, it's less about killing and removing and it's more about restoring. I just like to, you know, think of it that way. So the, you have to have management objectives and a strategy. Are you trying to um, prevent an, a new invasive species from establishing its, itself? Are you trying to suppress an invasive species, control, or completely eradicate? Um, if you have a large area, one helpful tool can be identifying management zones, setting your priorities and actions. So, you know, a priority could be um, I'm going to only focus on this species for the entire winter work period, or I'm only going to focus on this species. Um, so you can, you know, tar identify target plants. Are you going to work? Are you going to target the worst first, as in, you know, the, the most established, the most widespread, or the emerging first? You know, there, there is something to say about targeting an emerging invasive first because then you can prevent that invasive from ever establishing itself and um, control the environment, you know, maintain a healthy environment longer. Um, how do I identify your target plants? Will it escape to natural areas? So does it spread only by seed? What if I cut off the berries and prevent it from spreading that way? Then it won't escape, so you can wait till next season. You can focus on something else that is spreading rapidly right now. Um, does it threaten adjacent trees or other valuable plants? Does it prevent enjoyment or use of my property? Is it an emerging problem? Um, when you're identifying management zones, especially if you're in an extremely densely invaded area, you may need to um, do some trail cutting before you even begin invasive control, um, just so that you can, you can get to the work site, get to the area where you wanna work. Um, you also need to identify sites for debris piles. So this is especially important if you're clearing woody invasives like privet or iliagnus. Um, there's just so much plant matter. You need to identify exactly where your debris piles are gonna be and clear those areas first of invasives so that you aren't you know, piling, piling debris onto a site that's just gonna sprout right through and you won't be able to manage because there'll be all these sticks and debris on top of those. So it's before you start work, it's important to protect the desirable natives by flagging. Um, this is important for me because I actually, I have a very good invasive plant knowledge. Maybe not very good, but pretty good. I'm giving this presentation, um, but I do not have a very good native plant um, identification. So I'm, um, you know, I, I always have to check myself, make sure that I'm not accidentally killing a special native. Um, and so the easiest way is to sort of first do a walkthrough of the site. And if you notice any, any desirable natives, just flag them first so that when you're clearing, when you get sort of into the mindset of it, you aren't accidentally clearing natives. Um, it's important to avoid so soil disturbance. You know, I talked about this with um, kudzu, comes in after soil disturbance. It's actually true about almost all invasives. Um, this is, you know, we'll talk about methods soon, but, but sometimes pulling can actually be worse than cutting because by pulling you're disturbing the soil and it actually can invite new invasives in. Um, microcegium, for example, is usually established um, after a soil disturbance, even a very mild soil disturbance. Um, similar with removal of ground cover. So um, if you are managing an area that has English ivy ground cover, but also has um, shrubby invasives, then my suggestion would be to first focus on the woody plants and you know get the English ivy out of the trees, but to leave the ground cover until um, like sort of save it for last because it can invite in other invasives. So you want to be able to um, manage effectively. 
and be aware that you're going to have to follow up. It's, it's not one and done. Almost always there's going to be some re-sprouts. There's going to be some new invasives coming in. Um, yes. So let's talk about control methods. Um, there are, I'm sure many more than this, but the five sort of main control methods are hand pulling and digging, mulching, cutting and mowing, prescribed grazing by goats or sheep, um, or herbicide application, foliar or cut and treat. A combination of methods is almost always best, but any method, pretty much no matter what, will need follow-up, as I've said. It's important to think about the possible negative impacts of a method you're gonna be using and think about the effectiveness and efficiency. What tools do I need? Um, you know, what techniques should be employed for this plant versus this plant? Um, so we'll talk about all of these methods really briefly. So as I just mentioned, hand pulling does disturb the soil. It breaks sort of this protective skin of the soil and can either release an invasive seed bank or cause erosion or really just you know, create a disturbed environment which invites new invasives in to establish easier. Um, digging stumps similarly disturbs the soil and can damage nearby plants. And then remaining root, root fragments and rhizomes will break off, survive, and re-sprout. So, so often hand pulling is, is not the most effective method. Um, microcedrum, which spreads far and wide, but if it's in one very small area, can be hand pulled because it is it so easily comes right out of the ground and it doesn't, so it often doesn't break off and leave um, root fragments behind, but um, mowing is better for that. But hand pulling is an option. Um, I, I often see people hand pulling small privet sprouts, um, but almost, almost always it, it is not the best control method because of the soil disturbance and because of the likelihood of root fragments breaking off and being able to re-sprout. The hand pulling is not, not always the best method. Mulching is also not always the best method, but only because of its limited practicality. It, it works on small areas, but um, if this is your, your jam and you're gonna really stick to mulching, it, it can be effective. Um, it's, it can be very expensive, which makes it less practical. Um, so cutting or mowing. So sometimes simply cutting woody plants can make the problem worse. It actually can stimulate new growth and multiple stems where there was just one stem. Um, but that's with woody plants. If you have a grass like Japanese stilt grass, this is something I said on the Japanese stilt grass page, um, mowing in late summer to prevent seed set is one of the most effective methods. Um, of getting rid of Japanese stilt grass because it's an annual, it's it's coming back because of that seed set and the you know the seed bank, the seeds can stay viable for up to five years in the seed bank. So so preventing that seed set is is essentially the most important control method for Japanese stilt grass, and mowing can handle that. So mowing is a, a great control method for grasses or um, or for even something like kudzu, you know, eventually mowing over and over again can starve the root system. But with kudzu, there's this method, there's this thing called the kudzu chop. So basically, if you can find the root crown and sever it, then it cannot re-sprout. The problem is trying to find that root crown. But if it's a flat area and you're able to mow, then you're you're more likely to be able to see where that root crown is and um, sever it. Um, additionally, ivy, frequent mowing of ivy can eventually starve the root system. So mowing can be an effective method. It, um, to, in order to starve the roots, you have to sort of mow continually, you know, every time there's regrowth um, in order to, for that system to eventually die. Prescribed gra grazing with goats and sheep can, it's, it's very fun in theory. <laughs> And, um, you know, I've, I've seen the Chew Crew, you know, what UGA has hard at work. Um, but unfortunately, the, there are sort of 
a lot of downsides to prescribed grazing. Um, the roots of woody plants can survive for many years of repeated grazing. So, you know, like we were just talking about starving the root systems um, of other plants, starving the root systems of woody plants just by taking off the foliage, you know, just by a, a goat eating its leaves will take a very long time to eventually um, kill that woody plant. Um, you're limited to short plants, you know, three feet for sheep, four feet for goats. Additionally, you can't tell a goat what to eat and what to not eat. They will eat both invasive and desirable natives. Um, they also risk water pollution and seed spread and soil disturbance. Um, you know, they, they will eat and then they will poop. So, they're, you know, it's not, it's not just going away. It's going away, being processed, coming back. So, um, you know, additionally, I did, I saw a comment. I'm so sorry to hear about somebody's goat, but, um, or was it a sheep? Um, <laughs> some, some invasives are toxic, you know, perillament, as I mentioned, um, is toxic and so can result in, in the death um, of a goat or a sheep. Um, and microcegium or Japanese stiltgrass is actually unpalatable to a goat or a sheep. They, they just will not eat it. Um, so in that case, it's not effective at all. <laughs> um, one positive method of prescribed grazing is that it can clear foliage and small stems in an extremely densely um, invaded area to make it much easier for human access to the large stems. Um, for the fourth, fifth method I'm going to mention, which is herbicide application. Um, but another downfall is that it is costly. You have to um, establish and maintain a fence border, which can be costly in itself. And often, you know, if you're, if you're renting goats, that process can be very costly and it takes a lot of time. So it's not, you don't have a, you don't have the true crew in your backyard for a weekend, they're there for a, a while. Um, and then they would have to either stick around for a very long time in order to be impactful or come back the next season, come back the next season, come back the next season. So the fifth control method we'll talk about is herbicide application. Um, there are two main methods of herbicide application, which are foliar and cut and treat. The cut and treat method is my favorite, this is the most widely used um, among land managers. Um, and it is a concentrated herbicide treatment on directly onto the cut stump of an invasive woody shrub typically. So um, essentially you will cut an invasive plant about an inch or two off the ground and then immediately apply or concentrate herbicide directly to that cut surface. So this is effective um, year round and it's effective for both woody shrubs and for vines. Um, you know, it, oh, I just realized that my video wasn't, was it supposed to, I mean, I don't know, I can be off or on. Um, um, so anyway. If you're trying to use the cut and paint method on a vine, you'll you probably want to you know have a thicker vine. Wait till the vine is more mature so that there is enough sort of surface area in order to apply the herbicide. Um, foliar spray is a diluted herbicide, so rather than concentrated, it's heavily diluted and it's applied to the leaves of the plant, absorbed that way into the system. Both of these methods are effective at killing the roots of the plant unlike a lot of our other methods. So a lot of people feel very hesitant to use herbicides. I'm just gonna talk briefly about um, why they are, why I as a environmentalist, naturalist, conservationist believe in herbicide use. Um, first I'll mention that, that there are herbicide alternatives on the market. I, I strongly suggest that you stay away from these. Um, they, you know, are often touted as being organic or natural, but they are almost always very toxic. Um, they're advertised as an alternative to Roundup, but they're, they're not systemic, which means that they will not kill every 
plant, you know, they just can do really bad damage. And they often will do bad damage to, um, you know, not only to the plant, but to the person applying or to the surrounding soil or to the native little critters. Um, for example, household vinegar is marginally effective and only marginally effective on very young, very tender annuals. So um, that's not a very that's not a very good um, effectiveness rate. Horticultural vinegar, which is much stronger, is a little bit more effective, but it's extremely dangerous because of that acid level. It can cause permanent blindness if it's splashing your eye. It can burn your skin, and it can also kill or injure small animal animals such as toads or lizards or insects. Um, some people have tried vinegar and salt combinations. This is extremely detrimental to the soil microbes. It's really bad for the soil, can persist for a long time. Um, so herbicide alternatives are not suggested. Um, so this, I have sort of a question for you. Which is bad for the environment, invasive plants or carefully chosen, carefully used? herbicides. Invasive plants disrupt ecological functions. They cause environmental harm. They are a threat to native plants. They are a threat to biodiversity. Carefully chosen herbicides and you know, strategic use and proper use using, um, you know, following the label and wearing gloves and eye protection, etc. To can you know use using these herbicides to control invasive plants can cause little to no environmental harm and actually I would argue cause environmental good um, can can help to restore an environment. Um, glyphosate, which is the main herbicide that um, I use, it's it's sort of the least toxic herbicide. It is the least toxic herbicide on the market. It is. Um, a broad spectrum systemic herbicide used to kill weeds. And um, it was brought into the market under the trade name Roundup. So you may have heard this name before. Um, round, uh, glyphosate itself, the active chemical in Roundup is, is not a chemical to be feared if it is sort of respected like any other chemical, right? Like you, you should always have caution around chemicals, um, but if used, properly, it, it's very effective and has a very low environmental quotient. Um, you can see on this toxicity um, rating, it, it is only categorized as slightly toxic. Um, it's uh, way above um, nicotine, it's way above caffeine for coffee, it's even above table salt. Um, so it, it's all about sort of exposure and quantities. Um, this, you know, we can argue different ways to measure toxicity and stuff, but um, basically if used properly, glyphosate can be very effective and very safe. It has very low toxicity to animals. It has a metabolic pathway in plants only. Um, it only has a half-life of about a month and it's not active at all in the soil. Basically, as soon as it hits soil, it deactivates and it doesn't move. You know, that's um, sort of a misconception. If there are, you know, pounds and pounds of this herbicide on the, on the ground and then a really heavy rain comes, then of course that glyphosate will, will turn into runoff, but um, used in the way that it's used for invasive plant control, um, it, it will not run off because it doesn't move once it's in the soil. Um, it's a very good environmental quotient. And there are actually aquatic formulations that can be used in wetlands. So this is my favorite method, the cut and paint or cut stump treatment. It's gonna be used for trees, shrubs, and woody vines. Oops. Um, so it's very effective and efficient because, especially because you only have to use very small amounts of herbicide. So you know, you use a concentrated solution, like, like I mentioned, um, but that concentrated solution, which is 41% active ingredient glyphosate, that's what we use with NGICP. We actually dilute that in half, um, half and half with water. Um, and that is proven to be 
you know, just, you don't need much more than, you know, you never need more than 50% glyphosate, I would say. Um, it's just as effective as full strength, but with, if you do full strength, you're essentially wasting herbicide because you, you don't need to use a full strength product. Um, the best way to do this is to use an adjustable spray bottle, not a paintbrush. Um, a, a, this just uses the least amount of herbicide in the most effective way. Um, you have to apply very quickly. So um, a lot of invasive plants have sort of um, ways to, well, so, so once, you, once, you cut, <laughs> once you cut a plant, it will sort of set off its defenses. And that can be, you know, if you cut your arm and you develop a scab, a plant can sort of do a similar thing where they release their own chemicals to protect their cut um, very quickly. So we try to say, get the herbicide on within about 15 seconds before that has happened. And also oftentimes when you cut a plant, it will sort of, you know, bring all of its nutrients into its root system to try to, you know, maintain its health that way to be able to re-sprout. So if you catch it at the right time, it'll actually sort of suck in the herbicide into its root system, which is very effective, of course, of killing the, at killing the root system. Um, this method is effective year round when the ground is not frozen, but in Georgia, that's year round um, when temperatures are above freezing. So um, it's a little bit less effective in early spring. And that's mostly just because of um, the way plants are putting so much energy out and up in spring that they're more, they're less likely to sort of soak in herbicide into their root system. Summer and fall are winter. Winter is definitely very good. This, this is phrased not great. I think summer, fall, and winter are best times. Um, so cut the plant near ground level, apply the glyphosate solution immediately with a spray bottle to the entire cut surface. If it's a larger stump, like if you're cutting down a you know, nearly tree size invasive, you can, you can apply just to the outer, the cambium ring, which is, you know, that's, that's the important zone for where the herbicide needs to be. Um, it's important to avoid getting soil on the cut surface, as I mentioned, because glyphosate deactivates in soil. So, um, you know, if you're cutting your stumps too low to the ground and you're sort of shuffling along, you know, in really dense areas, oftentimes you stay sort of down on your knees, cutting and treating and cutting and treating. Um, if you're cutting too low to the ground and you're not watching where you're going, you may end up sort of covering that cut stump with kicked up dirt, et cetera. And that can um, end up sort of wiping the glyphosate off the top of that cut stump and, and making it less effective. There's also the hack and squirt method, which is very similar to cut and paint. This is when you're treating much larger trees or, you know, even a tree that you could cut all the way down, but you would rather it sort of die slowly. <laughs> um, you, can, you can leave a tree standing, um, you know, the trunk remains standing, but you make a series of cuts into that cambium layer, like I said, around the trunk and similarly immediately apply the concentrated herbicide within that 15 second window. Foliar spraying is another effective way of using an herbicide to manage invasives. You need to wet at least 90% of the leaves on each plant. So this is a, you know, this is a calculated, you wanna decide when it's best to, to do foliar spray because you have to have a plant where you're able to reach 90% of the leaves. Um, you need to have an air temperature above 60 degrees for best results. And it's best to apply to actively growing plants. So, um, you know, plants with full size dark green leaves. Evergreens on warm winter days is, are a good, a good plant to hit with a foliar spray. It's good to spray when the foliage is dry um, and preferably during periods of no wind. This is mostly for the sake of, you know, less spray off. You know, you don't want your, you don't want to be foliar spraying and the wind carries it off and suddenly you've oversprayed and accidentally harmed a nearby native. Um, you also want to, you know, when foliar spraying sort of observe 
your landscape. And if there are natives and invasives sort of intermingling, then you either want to be very careful with foliar spraying or just decide that that's not the best method for this site. Um, if, it's, if it's lightly raining, you can do a foliar spray if you're using a glyphosate product. Um, it can take some time for a plant to die from a foliar spray. So the, the, the product has much further to travel to get to the root system. If it's being soaked up in the leaves versus if you're spraying right on the cut stump, um, it just takes much longer with English ivy. It can take up to months for the, the plant to truly soak it in and just sort of slowly, sl slowly accept the consequences of being foliar sprayed. Um, one thing about foliar spraying that um, I think a lot of people don't realize is that you, you truly can use very low dosages of herbicide. Um, a one to 3% volume solution can work for thin leaved plants. So that's um, on Japanese silkgrass, foliar spraying is one of the best ways to manage, you know, along with mowing, if it's not if it's not August or September, but you wanna manage your um, Japanese silk grass, then using a foliar spray solution can be one of the best methods. Um, or a four to 7% solution for something like English ivy. Um, so that's you know for a plant with a thicker, waxier leaf. Um, so foliar spraying is, a, a better, you know, it's not as good of a method for woody plants, mostly because cut and treat for woody plants is so effective that it doesn't really make sense to try to foliar spray, um, especially just because those plants tend to be bigger. So they would require, um, you know, like you'd have to be very tall to get to, to the tops of the leaves sometimes. Um, there's just sort of obvious reasons for when to use foliar versus when to use cut and treat. Um, but this one to 3% volume solution, my colleague Gary, who I've mentioned a bunch of times by now, has actually um, discovered that this low dosage, this extremely low dosage of, you know, 1.5 ounces per gallon of glyphosate per water um, is effective at killing perillament and microstegium and not harming the nearby native plants. So he has he has figured that out over the past, I'd say, five years of study in the field that this low dosage um, um, sort of, it, it's effective for these thin-leaved plants, but our native plants tend to do okay. Um, this is, foliar spraying is another, it, winter time is a good time to do foliar spraying for the reason of a lot of our native plants um, are deciduous. And so if you have an invasive plant that is evergreen, then foliar spraying will harm that invasive plant, but will not harm the um, native plants because of that. So apply to evergreens on warm days in winter when most of the native plants are dormant. You can use this method on um, woody plants, like stumps that have re-sprouted. So they're still very low to the ground but they have a lot of foliage. So this is, if you were in a situation where, you know, we, I mentioned how mowing a woody shrub can often produce more sprouts and more stems or cutting um, without spraying can have that same effect. And if you allow a little bit of growth, growth after that, then you'll have a lot of foliage on a, you know, on a short woody stump. And so, you could use a foliar method um, to manage that plant. There's also um, basal bark treatment. Um, the best method, the best chemical for this is a triclopyr ester herbicide mixed with vegetable oil. And you need that oil compound um, sort of so that it sticks and soaks in. Um, there's no cutting needed with this method. It's effective on shrubs and trees with smooth bark. And it's best if it's under six inches in diameter. Um, June through January is best to do this method when the plant fluids are moving downward, but it, it can be used year round. Um, you apply the mixture to the, you know, 
bottom foot of the trunk and you can spray. I have seen people paint basil bark treatment onto trees as well. Um, and the, the dye, you know, as you can see in this photo, um, a lot of times actually, even in my spray bottles, I'll add a little bit of dye and that's just so that you can really see exactly where you are spraying, um, just so you can sort of catch yourself, make sure that you're not over spraying and make sure that you're not under spraying. You can make sure that you are hitting the entire stump. Um, so dye is just to help the applicator easily see coverage. So I mentioned debris piles earlier. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's a less, less invaded area, you can just leave your debris where it is. You know, if you have a couple privet sprouts and you cut and treat them and you're in the middle of the woods and they fall, you can totally leave them there. But if you want to create a debris pile, um, it is, it's good for creating sheltering habitat for insects and lizards. Um, birds really love to find insects in these piles. You, know, you can, after, after managing an area, you can actually watch a lot of bird activity in the debris piles. Um, so most invasive species, you know, once they are dry after being cut, they won't re-sprout. So there's no concern with leaving them, you know, in the woods where they are. Um, Japanese knotweed, which can re-sprout from the tiniest little bit left, um, needs to actually be bagged and brought off site so that it will not re-sprout. Um, attached seeds can be viable, so it's important to remove and dispose of the seeds and fruit when, when practical. You know, if it's a huge work day and you're managing so much, maybe that's not feasible, but if possible, it's best to get it all out. Um, Additionally, the wood of most of our most invasive species in this area is really soft. So actually the brush piles will decompose pretty quick and through that process, return nutrients back to the soil. And, and when you create a pile, you're actually, you know, you're gonna make that pile decompose quicker because sort of the weight of it weighing, weighing down the lower stems and um, it'll happen quicker than if they're all spread out individually throughout the woods. So there are several different herbicide applicators you can use, a backpack, a pump canister, a spray bottle, drip bottle, brush tip applicator, or a sponge. Um, it's important to check for leaks or drips. This is part of herbicide safety 101. You know, always wear gloves and always check for leaks or drips. That's to protect yourself, but that's also to protect the environment. You know, if you're working in an area where there are native plants nearby, you may not realize that you, you know, knocked your bottle over and it's leaking all over your very special native. Um, it's important to transport them in a larger leak-proof container, you know, like one of those giant Tupperwares is good. And you always need to label your contents and your percentage, percentage con concentration so you know, you know, oh yeah, I already diluted this 50% with water write that down so you don't dilute it again. Although sometimes a 25% active ingredient can, can work pretty well. Where do you buy herbicides? You can buy them at garden centers, farm supply. You can even get them on Amazon. It's really important to focus on the active ingredient instead of the product brand name. So 41% active ingredient glyphosate is my go-to. I would focus on that rather than saying, oh, she said this is active ingredient in Roundup, let me just buy some Roundup. Because there are tons of varieties. And um, if you're going for a brand name, you may get something that has a bunch of additional harmful surfactants or other chemicals thrown in there that um, are totally unnecessary to for environmental management. Hey, Carly, I just want to make sure you know we're actually over four time. minutes over. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you're like about done. This is about it. Yeah. yeah. Tools and equipment. These are pretty obvious. Um, get a bucket if you need it. Get a spray bottle. Um, I like to use the Corona brand folding saw and the Fiskars loppers. Those are my go-tos. A hedge trimmer can be really helpful. You can rent a brush mower if you're really feeling like you're trying to get it done. 
Okay, no excuses. Go manage your plants. <laughs> Anyone have questions? Is anyone still here? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we we missed um, or there was one question I know I saw in the chat and I tried to help, um, but it was a good question and it was with reference to the hack and um, squirt method. So if you have like a giant vine, English ivy or wisteria or something on a tree, is that an appropriate method for that? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's my go-to method. You know, even you know, with English ivy or with wisteria in a tree, um, what I'll do is cut out um, sort of like a chunk. So you know, the vine is going up into the tree. It's not. You do not need to um, try to pull the vine out of the tree. You can end up doing more damage to a tree that way. Um, but you can cut sort of like a chunk out, maybe, you know, five inches to a foot um, of the vine out and sort of try to pull the, pull the vine away from the bark of the tree and spray um, that lower section. And, and make sure that, you know, if it's English ivy, make sure you're getting every single stem that goes into the ground that all around the tree. Um, because if, if just one is, if just one is still connected and healthy, it can actually feed the entire system up in the tree. So you need to make sure you cut and spray every single one around the trunk. So just pulling it away from the bark is the safest way to, to try to not harm the tree and pulling it away carefully so you don't pull the bark off the tree. Um, well, we're at the end. And since we have reached this point, um, if you guys have more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and also feel free to unmute if you just want to ask me or Carly anything at this point in the program. Uh, before you go, here's a little QR code. We were, that's for our evaluation that I mentioned. We're also going to send you an email, but some people like to just go ahead and get it over with on their phones. I totally understand. So if you want to clip that real fast, you can do that now, or we'll send you that evaluation again tomorrow in an email. And if you guys have any follow-up questions or think of something down the road, you can always email us at our office and we'll do our best to answer you. And I can also get Carly on the line uh, if I need to. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for joining us as always. Our next Green Thumb Lecture is going to be in October, October 13th, and it's going to be on caring for houseplants, which we haven't had in a while. So I'm uh, excited to have that topic back on the lineup. So I hope you all have an excellent evening. And Carly, thanks so much again for your presentation. It's great. Of course. Yeah, I see one question from Emily I can answer really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, just asking about, um, although herbicides are more effective, if you have an area of, say, privet and don't want to use chemicals, what's the best way? to get rid of it and how many times do you expect it to come back? Um, so I would say any time, so, so I would still say cutting is better than pulling um, and avoiding springtime cutting is really important because especially in spring, just cutting without treating, you know, multiple stems will come back. That still will likely happen the, at least the first time that you cut but eventually that root system will starve. It just will take repeated cutting back and cutting back. Um, so, so it can be you know, pretty tedious, especially because you'll have smaller sprouts sprouting up from your initial cut stump. Um, that's, that would be my advice. Um, winter could be good, yeah. Um, I would say similar to cut and treat, you know, two inches above the ground. And that's mostly to avoid tripping hazards. You know, if you're cutting too high up, there's, still too much, you know, living plant outside of the soil, which, you know, you'll, you'll starve the root system faster if you cut lower, you know, even one inch above the ground, um, just so you won't trip over it. And um, the, the root system will likely die quicker that way. Now, I don't know how many times it, it would take. Um, yeah, it probably just to... depends on the establishment of that particular plant. Um, yeah. And they are surprisingly shallow rooted which is, yeah. makes me optimistic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not to mulch. No, you can totally mulch. Yeah. Yep. Can be a really effective method. I will say if it's in an area that will like, is going to be a future garden spot, because I've been in the situations, if you're not restoring, but you're like reclaiming for gardening, I have dug up well-established privet plants and 
like it was very, I was surprised how little regrowth um, I had from little root fragments. So that was an area that was going to be tilled and disturbed anyway. It wasn't like native forest, but um, it's awful to dig up, but it worked really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you absolutely can. It's, it's um, you know, as far as root fragments, it's all about being careful. Like I, I wouldn't say pull up, but dig up. You could do that, especially if it is going to be a, a disturbed area. Okay, edges over your yard. Yeah, yeah, I would say the, the least amount of soil disturbance, the, the better. Um, so cutting's best. But. We've got one more about stilt grass. Yeah, That's shoot, okay. go for it. <laughs> And you're welcome to unmute, Emily, if you just want to chat with us. But if you'd rather type, that's no problem. Yeah, that'll be easier. No, so we've got Japanese stilt grass.